over the Bay Area, uh, sometimes out of state, uh, in local library, in high school, um, in even Boy Scout, Girl Scout, uh, some, some uh, even elementary school sometimes I, I got invited, uh, or churches. So today I'm going to share with you how each family can actually maximizing maximize your college planning benefit. So I will talk about a dual track. I want, to, I want you to pay attention on the dual track. This is something, maybe it's not new, but if you want to put it together, then it works the best. And um, so I'm going to talk about the dual track. So the first, the dual track, the first track is college admission. And the second track we call, uh, the first track we call student positioning means that it's not just about college application, it's about how your students sit or stand among others applicants. Where is this student's position compared to other applicants? So that's called student positioning. The second strategy is called financial positioning. So from the perspective of financial preparation, where do you stand? Do you know how much you will be paying towards your kids' college tuition? And what's the asset allocation that the school will assess and add it back onto your own shoulder? So if you know how school assess your income and asset, and you know how to position and reposition accordingly that is favor, favorable to you, then your, your financial responsibility can be reduced. This is something that we can take action and we can do it. So tonight, uh, in tonight's uh, workshop, I'm going to share with you these two strategies and the best way for you to maximize your college funding is to take the strategy concurrently it means that you take action doing it at the same time you do not like okay i want to help my kids get into the college after they get into college get accepted to a college then i starting to worry how i can fund my students it will be too late so you have to do it concurrently so that's the key that's the secret so first part, let's do, in, do some update about the admission. And um, because this is an online uh, training, so I do not know our guests in here, how many guests here, they have high school students or how many they have like lower grade students. But it uh, doesn't matter if your kids are in high school or still in elementary or junior high, uh, the, the following information I'm going to share with you still will give you a general direction. So even though your kids are still young, this direction will help you how to guide your students as they move along towards uh, college application age. Okay, all right. So first, I am a college counselor, a certified college planner, but I do not focus on just college admission. Because if you only focus on college admission, that is too short of version. Why? Because the vision is too short. The, why the vision is too short? Because um, the, we, for college education, it's only what? It's only a to-do list on our, on our journey. But you don't want to just send your kids to college. That's it. You want to send your kids into the college and also get well equipped so that what? So that they can graduate and then they can find a place in the society. So because I do belong to a uh, certified college planner organization, it's a national organization. So we do have the power to do some survey and research. And that's why we come back with the uh, big 500 companies in the human resources, what they are looking for, what kind of traits they are looking for from our students. So they are looking for students that they have the innate initiative and they want to, they can in, integrate with the coworkers. So no longer if you are an expert, you are especially good in certain area, but you don't have any people skills and then you feel good about it, then that's not good enough because they are looking for people who can cooperate, who can integrate, who can be a team player in an organization. And number two, the skill that they are looking for is the learning agility. It means that you have to have the curiosity all the time. You have like being like a sponge. You can absorb information, you can digest, you can retell, you can apply. So learning agility is something that is, a, you can say it's a, it's a 
character or it's a, it, it, even a skill set that is required in this future marketplace. Number three, the combination of soft skills and the ability to work tactically, okay? That means what? You cannot just own the hard skill. Hard skill is not enough. You have to have the soft skill. Soft, soft skill mainly is that your understanding ability, how you can walk into other people's shoes. You can understand other people's standpoint. And then also you can agree the disagreement. So that's something, that's also something, the traits that we have to have or help our kids to have. And go beyond the job description, being a, be a team player, same thing. You cannot just say, okay, I'm only want to be good or doing good on my own share, just do my job, whatever I can bury my head into be a good engineer, do whatever I'm good at, but I totally ignore the environment around me. You sometimes need to, to cross this department and offer your help. And also you, you'd be able to um, lean to building empathetic connection. That's another skill set. And empathetic uh, connection is mean, means that you can understand other people's standpoint, right? Walk into other people's shoes. And also you have to have strong emotional intelligence. That's what we call EQ, right? Emotion quotient. And for emotion quotient, not only just understand other people's needs, understand other, other people's position, but also important is that, do you know yourself? Do you know who you are? Do you know where's your strength? Do you know what is your passion? Do you know what is your weakness? Can you do damage control on your weakness? Can you leverage others' strengths so that we can all become a better person, more well-rounded person? This is something extremely important nowadays. I have seen many, many engineers. They are so good with their technical, yet their soft skill is lacking. Their EQ is not very, uh, is not underdeveloped. So sometimes when there is a layoff happening, usually those people got laid off and they were wondering, my technical is so strong, so good. Company needs me, how come I'm on the list? Well, they are looking for team players. They're looking for people who can work with other people. If you cannot do that, you cannot present that, you cannot present yourself in that way, then you probably will be in trouble. So the following seven traits are said, are mentioned in the book by a professor in Harvard, Harvard University. So he uh, addressed that the following seven traits are a leader should have. And that's what the college are looking for. So when the college are reading your uh, students application, they are trying to find from their GPA, their test score, their extracurriculum, their leadership position, their resume, everything, their essay. They're trying to find, to identify if they own the seven traits or not. So if they have good character, can they collaborate? That's a teamwork, right? Creativity, hence there is an essay specifically uh, dedicated for creative writing. So creativity, and are they up to embrace the challenge or they just try to run away from the challenging? Uh, the, the one way to demonstrate if your kids can take the challenging is that they will take a look how many AP classes that your school offer. If your school offer many, many AP classes and your student only take two, one or three and compared to other applicants who take maybe five or even six then of course the other students will have more demonstration about the ability of facing challenge so this is just the from your courses selection they're gonna do that okay curiosity is a little bit tied into creativity are you like want to find solutions for the problems that you are facing or the society is facing. Can we find solution instead of just making complaints? Commitment, okay, so they're gonna see from your student's resume that have they involved in any student club or any kind of organization that has fairly length of engagement 
So they don't want to see students hop around to many different organizations or clubs. Maybe there'll be one student, they just like to do things. So they attend maybe five, six clubs, yet they never focus or dedicate themselves into one or two clubs. And that way, that doesn't look good, even though it shows that you have many interests, but it doesn't show that you have the commitment. So when you turn it into um, first, I mean, freshman, sophomore, it's okay that you hop around because at that age, you are still trying to find something that can really interest you. But once you turn into junior year and senior year, you want to focus on one or two clubs that you are really like, okay? And once you really like, or you have passion about it, try to engage yourself in such a way that you can have a official position. And that way it will help you on your resume. It looks better. And also uh, you can really contribute whatever uh, you have because you have engaged long enough. Diversity, every school is looking for the student body. They have the student body but no school, once their school student body is only lopsided with one certain kind of race. They want to see the diversity in such a way that they have different races from different background of family and different type of income. Hence, they want to recruit people who from more like a lower income family. They want to have people, students from middle income family. They also want to have people from more affluent family as well. So college will be just like a shadow of a real society. So hence the diversity is very important. So for the students getting there to get education later when they get out, they go into the marketplace. They won't have cultural shock because at college they already get used to deal with different kinds of races of people and from different kinds of background. So that's the seven traits that school are looking from a student. So many, many um, being in this industry, uh, in this college planning industry since 2008 until now, I have met numerous, numerous families and students. But, you know, well, as much as most of the parents wish their students can go to Ivy League schools, right? They think that's a good school and then they can guarantee with a good job later. Yet, to be honest with you, there will be only maybe less than 10% of the students that they are identified as those top colleges. And majority, 90% of students, that it's not they are not smart. There are some of the students still straight A students, yet they are lacking in the leadership position. Their GPA, GPAs, test score are all good. Somehow, they are lacking some personal or people skills and they are lacking of the direction of their future. They, they kind of like, a, they, don't have, they don't have the strong vision. They don't see who they are. They don't see where they can be. So that type, type of students, what do you do? What do you have? If you have students that they are to be the Ivy League material, I'm telling you, you are, you will be like, the, your students actually will be driving you, not you to drive your students. All those Ivy League students, I mean, Ivy League material type of students, when they were young, you can already observe their behavior. Even they are young, they are pretty much are those we call high efficient, highly efficient students. They do good on time management, they can do multiple tasking job. They not only their GPA are sharp, their extra curriculum are also, you can see very diverse. And if there is party going on, you can see them there as well. They're very social. So those type of students, they are innate or they are naturally born leaders. So they will drive their parents. They will tell their parents, this is my schedule for this week. I need to be at where, at what time. So please help me to get there or arrange a ride for me to get there. So they will be kind of sitting in the driver's seat and then you just really be the driver, okay? You, you be the actual driver to drive them to the places. 
but 90% of the students, I will say, uh, some are struggling with their grades, but some are still straight A students, yet they just don't know uh, what to do with their life. So what about those ordinary students? How can they demonstrate their leadership? Because leadership is one thing, especially right now is COVID-19. A lot of school already canceled the SAT test score, stuff like that. So how can a student still demonstrate that they are the students that your school should recruit? Then they have to see if they have the leadership positions. So they have to shift the weight from maybe SAT score, ACT score, and put a little bit more weight on the rest, which is including the leadership position. So the first story I'm going to share with you is one of our students. Uh, we met the students at 10th grader. And this student, just like a regular student, his GPA is okay, a, a little bit above 3.50. It's not a straight A student. And uh, his passion is just, uh, well, I can say every teenager's passion is to play video game. So after school work, he came home and then he would do his homework. After he'd done his homework, then he would just spend time and doing the video game. And now comes to 10th grader, nothing much else. And so the parents are very worried about that situation. And you know teenagers, sometimes if they shut down, they shut down, they don't wanna talk. So the parents has nothing, no other way, but to find them a counselor. So our counselor sit down with the students. And then after a few sessions, we talk, we get into his heart, try to build the relationship and the trust. So we finally found out this student is good at doing, besides the video game, he's good at doing uh, the aviation modeling, the model, the, the small airplane, miniature airplane. So for that, the teacher just uh, remind him, he say, hey, maybe you should uh, think about form a club of this because his school does have um, a chess club, robotic club and other club, just no uh, aviation model club. So the teacher, uh, the counselor give him this idea and also help him to just draft a proposal and then brought it to the principal. So the principal liked this proposal and assigned an instructor, a teacher to be the uh, instructor. So help the students with his, his other two students all together, they just found this club. And they just need to arrange a couple of activities during the school years and this club officially founded. And guess what? This student will be the founder of this club. And that will give him something to write on his essay. The next student that he's also uh, a student that actually his grades is not too bad. It's 3.75, 3.8 in that range, in that neighborhood. The thing is that, again, this, this the problem of this student after we talk, after we talked this family, we found out his, the problem of the students actually is the parents should uh, take responsibility a little bit. Why? Because the parents' parenting method is very different. The mother is some kind of tiger mom. So she, is like, she likes to micromanagement her children, even her husband's schedule and daily activities. Micromanagement just want to know everything, like control everything. And the dad, on the other hand, is a person who is a little bit laid back because the dad, when he was growing up, his parents kind of just let him do whatever. So he doesn't feel that he has too much, some, no parental, too much parental guidance, you know? So he still grow up and still be a good engineer out there. So he would think, well, kids will just grow up, okay? Don't worry, don't, have, don't, don't, be, don't need to do those micromanagement. But I guess it's the personality issue. So when the dad portrays to be more relaxed, more laid back, that caused the mom to become, to, to become even more intense, more nervous. So in that situation, the kids got caught in between. So he kind of like, you know, we should watch it flip flop. And um, he, so his, his grades is just okay. And he spent a lot of time online chatting, also play games, stuff like that. So the teacher again, sit down with the students and he has to send away the parents because when the mom was there, the students would just close his mouth, will not talk at all because 
every time this, the, the teacher asks a question to the students, the student hasn't even opened his mouth to answer yet. The mom will just jump into the answer. Oh, no, 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 you are like this, you are like that. So the student has no, you know, has no position to say anything because the mom already said the conclusion. So we had to send away the parents and sit down with the students. Also, again, after several sessions, the students is already uh, become more open. And then we found out that these students, besides the video games, stuff like that, at least he liked to ride bike. He feel relaxing when he ride bike. So then hence, we talked to the dad. We said, dad, can you like allocate one uh, once per week, two hours or one hours, you can ride a bicycle with your son. Just build up the father and son relationship. Also help your son to relax a little bit. And also we tell the son, we said, riding bicycle is just a hobby. So it's not get you anywhere, but uh, go home, check your garage. Do you have any like the tricycles, the smaller size of bicycle that you have gathered along this time? Um, and, and they are gathering the spider webs right now, gathering dust in your garage and learn how to fix them up. Maybe change the tire, mix, fix something, fix some parts and clean them up and then use social media. Okay, and then raise the attention, get your friends engaged, tell them to clean up their garage and do the same thing. And then you can gather all the fixed up bicycles and then you guys can send it to the underprivileged zip code to their children there. So these stu students really made this happen. And that is a beautiful project. He feel proud of himself. He feel he is contributing. He finds some purpose of doing things, not just like being scolded by parents or nagging by parents. So he feel he found something. And since then, his grades also starting to pull up. So later, the students get into UCSD. And uh, we met the students one time after he was in college, okay? So I can tell you in front of my eyes, because I'm also a mother of three children. So I do have the mother heart. So when I met him one day after he was in, uh, in college, and he came back during summertime, I still remember when the first time I saw the students in our office, you know, my impression, because he's so quiet and he's so sad. So my impression, he's kind of tiny, kind of small because he, I feel he's withdrawing. But this time when I saw the students in front of me, he's tall, big build and handsome and confident. So I guess it's the impression, it's your body language to portray so let you totally see different. But when I first see the students, he's 10th, uh, 11th grader until 12. But now it's only freshman, only three, three years progress. A student cannot grow that big difference. However, the body language totally changed my impression. So that's how we can really help your students. I mean, you can help your students that to grow into a man that he is supposed to be or a woman that she is supposed to be. And the third story is my own children, one of my own children's story. I have three children, I, as I have told you, and my first child is a boy and he's an introvert. So as an introvert, um, it's okay. You know, introvert actually is very powerful because they are thinker. I myself is an introvert as well. Even you see I'm talking, like talk so loud in front of you, but actually, uh, my personality is an introvert. So my son got that from me. So introvert is okay, no problem. But the thing is that we found out my son's um, grades is kind of getting struggling. Once he gets into junior high school, he takes, he intended to take longer time than others, average students when he uh, does his, uh, did his homework. So that situation become worse and worse. And then, so we have done then we have to do a test on him. So once we've done a test on him, uh, the the, it's called personality test and his learning style test. So then we found out that this student, this my son, his learning style is called a hands-on learner. So hands-on learner is that this kind of students, the best way for, for them to learn is by doing. So they can learn by actually doing it. 
you their worst way to learn is lecturing or reading or even visual visual may help help a little bit but listening and reading is probably uh, not his cup of tea that's why he will be struggling so in that case we cannot just hire a tutor to help him because it won't work too well so at that time we just make a decision we starting to engage him at junior high school level. We starting to engage him into a some kind of um, community services. Okay, even though we understand for junior high, even though you engage in community services, the hours won't count. But it doesn't matter. It matters is that he can learn things by engaging in doing something. That's how he learned, how he learned to interact with other people, how he learned to finish a project. So by the time when he graduated from high school, for high school four years, he has accumulated about 500 hours in community service. And that community service hours is in child care, in, in leading children's program. And later, Fortunately, is that during those six years, including the two years in junior high, he has developed he has developed a love for children's education. So later, his major was elementary education. Okay, and he he later when he applied to college, he wrote the essay. It's so convincing, so touching that they admission officer can totally see this student does have a passion about children education. So even though his GPA, even though his test score is not very impressive at all, but because of his real life experience and that community service hours that the school takes him, not only takes him in, also give him scholarship to go to. So that's why I want to tell parents, scholarship is not only for straight A students. My son's GPA is far away from straight A students, yet he received scholarship to get in. The reason is that because he totally portrayed himself from his experience. He is the person that that school wants to recruit, okay? So now he is a official uh, teacher in a public school and he's doing what he, he loves. And that's every parent's dream. I don't know about your dream. My dream is not to have my kids to become millionaire or you know just become super rich. I want them to be a responsible person, know who they are, know their standing, their position, and uh, also know that they have something in there that's their passion, and that passion can contribute back to the society and they can make a living out of it. And they will be a person of a purpose-driven life. They can live a life with purpose-driven. So that's something I'm pursuing. And I also uh, wish my kids can pursue that as well. So college admission, college, they, they, they don't actually just admit perfect students, straight A students. They are more looking for students. If you have the enthusiasm, you have the passion are you a person that can engage in the community and starting by engaging in your own family life? Okay, so they want to see that. So from your essay, that will give away. That will give away if you are such a student will engage in the community and engage in your family. So that's why I do not advise students that you have to go uh, to those fancy summer camp to spend $10,000 or those high dollar amount just to go to do those fancy camp because you feel that experience can look make you look good on your resume. If you are crunching in dollars, you would rather have your kids engaged in community, in their own surroundings, local surroundings. They don't have to go far away to volunteer into a third developed country and then to build houses for them in order to show that they have a good heart. They don't, they can just do things. Just like I said, the students clean up the bicycle and send it to underprivileged zip code area in his neighborhood or a, a, a different city. That is a good deed. That is something that you showing that you can engage in the community. 
However, if you want to send your kids to those fancy camps, maybe like uh, offered by uh, some uh, university, famous university, the only reason that you want to know is that once your kids get there, they were starting to pre-taste a little bit college life. And also they can get to know other students from different school outside their own school network. So that they will get inspiration. They will get some inspiration. After they come home, they may form a group, group online and they will continue to communicate with one another. And then later when they apply college, they might exchange information or they, they might uh, uh, inspire one another. So that's a good thing. So don't just bet on, I send my kids to a fancy summer camp. Uh, it's because they're gonna look good on their resume. And also there will be some SAT, ACT that the school already, they say, we're gonna waive it. So on the screen showing that some school already announced that and this, le this list continue to grow and including UC as well. And uh, this is not only for this upcoming years, some already say they're gonna do the next year. So which is means the students are 11th grader this year, okay? But from some uh, advisor, from some college counselor in, uh, or college admission officer in the college, they will still tell you, even though it's, uh, it's COVID-19, a, a lot of students work got impact, but still don't take this as an excuse to slack off, okay? So you still have to demonstrate your, um, how, can you, how can you be spontaneous? to this situation, the COVID-19, nobody can expect this to happen. But what is your reaction? What is your response? How do you react? And that will demonstrate your leadership, okay? So now because of the SAT, ACT, a lot of this standard test score is no longer uh, needed because there's um, no place for you to take the test. So then the college will switch a little bit weight on different factors. One of, one of it is the essay. So essay now becomes even more important. Why? Because you have to demonstrate your own personality, demonstrate your character, demonstrate your mindset, your philosophy, your value system, so that the school can see, hey, if this student has the same value system that is very similar or syn synchronized with our system. So this student will become the student they want to recruit. If they want to recruit the students, of course, they're gonna not only admit your students, they are also going to what? Give them scholarship to go to. So hence, how to write this essay become important. So um, we do have students, they are very good in writing, but unfortunately their writing is more like a, a literature style, like poetic writing. So there's one student, wow, her essays look like you're reading Shakespeare, but the teacher just turned her down. So the teacher said, well, for essay writing, it's not a time for you to showcase your poetic, poetic writing skill. It's the time for the, for the admission officer, the reader, to know what kind of person you are. What's your value system? So the way you write the essay has to be a way like your reader, when the reader is reading your essay, it's like they are literally seeing a movie that you are showing there. They wanna show you as the main character in that movie. And I wanna see your, your, your personal life. So if an essay, if you cannot attract a reader with the first to the second paragraph, then this is not a good essay as well. So you try to write it in a narrative way, almost like a novel, but it's your story. And also the percentage wise, you want to say two thirds will be on the positive side. Maybe one third is your question. So don't like doing different, uh, different ways. Like, okay, I'm gonna, I'm gonna address my problem, okay? My darkness for like two thirds in my essay and only one third about how I conquer it. Then that way is totally wrong and that won't be a good essay. So since COVID-19, the school all shut down and in, even in the coming years, a lot, of, a lot of freshmen in college right now, they are frustrated, okay? Because they, 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 they are so eager to get into the campus. They want to be a student there. They want to enjoy the social life, but now they don't have the chance. So the school also, they, they're gonna stay online. 
and uh, for the high school students and for the younger students in your home that you want to pay attention a little bit to their uh, mental health right now. Because right now, the thing is that we all think this generation, the Generation Z, the millennial afterwards, Generation Z or even Generation Alpha, that they are born with 3D, uh, they are born with all those uh, uh, the digital world. So they are good with iPhone, smartphone, any computer or, or electronic gadget. So they enjoy online doing things. But yet, in deep down in their heart, they still craving for human contact, human connection. So right now, because of this COVID-19, this is one of the students. He wrote a blog on the CNN. Uh, there's a, he wrote a blog, and then he just said, he just addressed his frustration. He said, right now, they cannot do group, group projects in person. They cannot do group projects. They cannot attend their own prom nights. They cannot celebrate their own graduates um, celebration party. They cannot even go. They cannot even attend. And all they do is just talking online. So they say they miss so much. Even the cafeteria lady, they miss a hug from them. They miss the, the, the school guard, the campus guard, the high five from the campus guard. So all that things you can know in their heart. Sometimes they feel very, very lonely, disconnected, okay? So when you have kids at home, even though I know you are very busy because you had to be busy with your job, but, uh, and then also you see them in their own room, close their door in their own world, uh, texting maybe, but after deep down, they are craving for a human connection. So now I'm going to move to the second part. The second part, we're talking about uh, the college expenses. So. When your kids get accepted to the college of their, their preference and you are happy, you're so happy, but now you will come to the part, how do I pay for it, right? But do not wait until your kids get accepted. Then you start to thinking, how can I pay for their tuition? You have to always think ahead, stay on the top of the game so that you have time to reposition or relocation, relocate your assets in a way that you are financial responsibility can be reduced. Right now, let's take a look of the, we call cost of attendance, okay? So that's the total number that your students get admitted to a college that they will be charged. So for UC, they'll be charged about 36,000. Private colleges, 72,000. State university, about $27,000. And that need to times four and times the number of your children in your family. And the thing is that the tuition, they have an infl uh, inflation ratio that is higher than our living uh, inflation ratio. Our living uh, inflation ratio is about 2.5 to 3%, but for school tuition runs six to 7%. So I still remember when my kids were uh, get into the college and they, they were in the private colleges. So the first time, first year when they get in, when they got in is about 54, 56,000 and then gradually moved to 60,000, 65,000. By the time they graduate, it's almost hit 70,000. So I know that the, the, the speed is really, really fast. Then your race, okay, if you work for corporate, then definitely, uh, higher, faster than the race you can get from your company. So plan for financial aid is everybody's to-do list. It's not just for like low-income family. It's also for the middle-income family because the middle-income family, family has to pay so much on tax. And then if they do not know how to reduce a little bit financial responsibility on the college tuition, then when the, by the time when the kids go to college, they feel they are really broke. So we can divide it, all of our audiences, into four categories. Either you are middle-income family, low assets, or you are middle-income family, but with high assets, or you are high-income family, but with low assets, or you are high-income and high assets. How, how do you define low-income, high-income, low assets, high assets? I can just use some examples. Let's say for uh, UCs for public schools. If your household income is within $150,000 in your income, then it's considered middle, okay? So you will still be able to get some financial aid. 
if you are over than 150, then uh, financial aid from public school is out of question. Yet, for private colleges, you are still being considered low-income family. Because why? Because their tuition is much higher. So as long as your income is below than 300,000 or 300, even 350,000 to private colleges, you still have chance to get, we call it need-based aid. And what about assets? Assets is more like your bank statement, your bank, your stock, your mutual fund, or if you have rental income and stuff like that. And if you have like a 529, and that we have some slides specifically will tell you what are the assets that the school will assess and will be counted against your financial responsibility. So let's move along and then you will get more and more understanding. So when we talk about cost of attendance, we can separate them into direct cost and indirect cost. So the direct cost, including your tuitions, your fee, your room and board, that's pretty much fixed. Indirect cost, they may vary a little bit. Textbook, computer, equipment, personal expense, insurance, transportation. So by the name, you, you can know, right? So how much money you wanna give your students as they are parking money. So that can vary. And uh, what, where is the school located? It's in East Coast, and while your home is at West Coast, and then East Coast flying to West Coast, of course, the transportation will be higher and also depends on how many times you want them to come home. So direct cost and indirect cost combined together, we call cost of attendance. And another index number is called EFC, which stands for expected family contribution. So this is the number that the school decide you need to participate in your children's education. And how does this, this number comes out is when your students apply college, you should help your students to file another application form. It's called FAFSA. And also the second set form is called CSS profile. So those forms, you need to file in very detailed number about your household income, about your assets allocation, about even what kind of car you're driving and do you have any rental property? Do you have any land? Um, do you have 529? Um, stuff like that. They're gonna ask all the questions. And after you answer those questions and they will have a calcul calculator behind the application, they're gonna calculate it based upon some weight. They have some weighted factors. And at the end, a number called EFC will come out. And that's where they decide you need to participate in your student's application, uh, college expenses, okay? But however, one thing is that your EFC will also be determined by how many students you have that in the college at the same time. Let's say this family has three, just like me, I do have three children, right? So let's assume my EFC is $36,000. So when my first son going to college, then I had to pay $36,000. If his tuition is more than $36,000, then I will get paid, not paid to me, but will pay towards, knock down the tuition by the financial aid. But when the second of my second child get into college, and then the, I have two students in the college at the same time. So my EFC will be divided by two. So each of my children only expected to pay 18,000 and the rest remaining balance will be covered by financial aid. And if you have three kids that is overlap in years or you have triplets, then when they go to college, your EFC will divided by three, go on and on. So the number of the students in your family will also make you your EFC either higher or lower. So when we talk about financial aid, there are many resources, not just one. A lot of parents, when you talk about financial aid, in their mind, they actually are only thinking about government grants, okay? But financial resources has many different, coming from different places. Number one is, of course, government aid, government grant. 
and it can come from federal and state. Number two, it's the school grant. So this is from the school's own pocket. Number three, we call work study. So this is the money that your students has to work a little bit on campus. And in exchange, they pay the students to knock down their tuition. Number four, subsidized student loan. Now this is a student loan, but it's subsidized, which means that your interest is weak. So it's a good loan, it's a good cash flow for you. You can just take it. And then after your kids graduate, you help them to pay out and that's fine. Otherwise, the interest will start to incur after they graduate. Number five is unsubsidized loan. Of course, you see the word loan, you need to pay back, but uh, because it's unsubsidized, means that when you accept this loan, the interest will start to incur. So fairly enough that we usually will not ask other parents to turn on this loan. Then the, net, the last but not the least is called the tax scholarship. So this one is a little bit confusing, or a little bit uh, hard to understand. So this one will work the best for if you are a small business owner, if you do not have W-2 income, but you do own 1099 income. If you have 1099 income, means that you are either a contractor or you own your own business. So if you are that type of uh, parents, then uh, for the tax planning wise, when your kids come to college, there will be different tools for you to, to adapt. And then if you do that kind of planning, fairly enough, you're gonna save a chunk of money that you owe to IRS that current year while your kids are going to college. But because of this tax planning that you can save a bunch of tax at that current year, and we defer that tax payment to later year so that the tax due, the current year tax due can be reserved to pay your kids tuition. Does that make sense? So that will be available to mostly is the 1099er or your contractor or small business owner. Okay, so we have gone through the financial aid and we gone through the COA and the EFC. So as I have uh, talked to you earlier that the COA is the number published by the school. So you cannot change the number. However, the EFC is can be managed by asset reposition. So if we reposition the assets, your EFC may be reduced. So the COA minus the EFC, guess what? The gap will be bigger. Once the gap is bigger, then you have more chance to receive financial aid or receive better or larger amount of financial aid. Now let's take a look at what kind of assets that school will be assessed. So your assets can be allocated in among the following three category. The first category in there is that if your asset has any gain that is over $10 that year, you are required to file tax. So we see your CD, your stock, your mutual fund, your real estate. The second category is that the assets growth in this bucket, you don't owe tax the current year. So they can defer and defer and defer until later when it's time for you to harvest the gain. Then when you take the money out of this pocket, the principal has never been taxed before. The gain has been deferred to grow in here. So once you take the money out of this bucket later, the principal plus the gain will be taxed at your income tax bracket. So mostly you can see are your retirement account. The third bucket is the money that when you invest in this third bucket, the money is called after tax dollars. Means that the money has been paid to IRS one time. Once you pay it one time, you don't have to still let it stay in the first bucket and to grow. And next year you pay tax again. So if you get one haircut one time, you fulfill the IRS requirement. You can what? 
transfer or we call relocate to the third bucket and have your money grow in the third bucket. And guess what? All the capital gain will grow tax deferred and continue to compound, compound, compound. The best thing is that even they grow tax deferred, by the time when you take it out to use the gain and the principal is all tax free. Why? The remember the principal has been has paid tax one time already. So when you take the principal out, it's tax free. But the best part is the gain in this category is also tax free. So we can see there is Ross IRA, there is Muni Bond, there's 529, and there's the 7702 program. Okay. So now let's take a look. Among all these programs, what are the programs or the assets that will be assessed by the school versus non-assessed? So non-assessed means the assets that will not be counted to add it up to your EFC, okay? So let's take a look. Um, I want to show you one slide to tell you the answer. And that slide is showing on government side, which is the FESA site. okay? So in here, it shows the investment will include, means that they will include and calculate your EFC, including your real estate, except your home, by rental properties, trust funds. So some people say, hey, I have family trust. Family trust is only for you to avoid probate. So the, the assets in there will still consider your EFC. UGMA, UTMA is kind of like a gift account. And money market, mutual funds, CD, stock, stock option, bonds, security, installment, even land sale and commodities. In investment also include including 529, okay? However, investment do not include your the home you live in, the value of life insurance, which is 7702 program, retirement, anything regarded to retirement account. So let's go back, go back based upon the government's information. Now we understand everything in this blue bucket will be counted against your EFC. Everything in this green bucket will not count it against your EFC. The items in the yellow bucket, Muni bond is still a bond. So that will consider to be your assets to be calculated into your EFC. 529, it's an education designated program. Yes, when you take it out to pay for your kids' tuition, you don't have to pay tax on that for the gain. Yet, unfortunately, the whole balance in your 529 will be calculated as your assets when your kid's about to, to apply financial aid. Okay, so I hope you understand the principle now. And now you know why asset relocation and asset reposition will help you to reduce your EFC, okay? All right, so later when your kid's about to select some high school to apply, uh, our advice is that you need to do some research because every school site will give you the information. What kind of philosophy when it comes to college funding? Some school will say, our school will 100% sponsor the students. We try our goal, let's say one school says. They will offer, they offer, they gonna, the school will offer empowering education and ensure students can leave college without the burden of student debts. What does that mean? That means this students will be, uh, this school will be very generous, gener generous to give out student aid, financial aid, so that their students will not end up with much, much burden when they get out of school. 
but there will be the other type of school we call spread the love. That means that they want to give students, every admitted students, they want to make every student happy once they admit it. So they kind of spread the love. Everybody give you maybe 10,000, 9,000 here, 7,000 there, just to make you feel happy, okay? So when you do the school research, if the money is something that you want to consider, then when you choose select the school, you need to uh, be careful about their website and you can take a look. But the school that give out money doesn't mean they are bad school. Some are the prestigious school, why? Because, just because they are prestigious. So they have a lot of outstanding alumni. When they graduated and then they make good in the society, they want to give back, okay? So they give back, they donate back. And then they will have uh, that huge endowment fund to be distributed to their students. So University of Chicago is one of them. I have students, their parents are earning high income. High income, both parents are engineers in the startup company and they have stock options going on, but their students get admitted to University of Chicago and they knock down 50% of the tuition. So that's a good thing. That's a good thing that you want to consider, okay? And um, the next I'm going to show you, uh, because in Bay Area, most of our parents wants to focus on STEM program, right? So what about if you you have students, but they are they do not go to the STEM? If you go to STEM, it's you know it's it's easier for them. Not easier. I mean, it's more like um, uh, you can you can you know you know the path. I can say you maybe you know the path how to lead them. But what about if you have students? They are the non traditional students. They don't want to go to STEM. They want to do different thing. So I'm going to share with you my daughter's story. And this is the picture, this is the, the, the drawing that he drew when she was in, in school. So my daughter uh, was a student. Uh, she, actually, her brain is very balanced, left, left brain and right brain. Why I say that? Because his, her math, her science, her, uh, her writing, her reading, English is all good. And especially, she has this art. She, she's very artistic. She has this talent, okay? When she, when she was little, uh, she is very active. But the only thing can keep her calm and stay in the same spot for long hours is just drawing. So she just like to draw. And in the beginning, she only think this is one of her uh, hobbies. So she never thought she wants to do this, uh, do the business, make this a career. So she planned to become a doctor in medical school one day because she's really into um, you know, health stuff. But then one day when she turns into junior year in high school, she told me that she found out her calling inside of her is so strong that she cannot ignore that she wants to become a, an artist and she wants to be in the uh, entertainment industry to do movies to do um, animation or doing design. So because of her strong desire, so we support her, okay? So we gather her portfolio and then we went to college visits and we find some good colleges for her. And because also her GPA is good as well. So she is kind of, a, unlike my, uh, my first child, her GPA is also good as well. And so she got admitted to a private colleges, but that's a, purely art school, okay? So she was there and uh, getting edu education and uh, getting scholarship as well. Because at that time, when she was in the college, her brother, her older brother was still in college. So I have two kids in college at the same time overlap for three years because they are only 15 months apart. So the, for the next three years, my daughter was in college. My EFC is divided by two. Plus, both of them get scholarship. My son gets get scholarship from his school. My daughter gets scholarship from her school. So that's why college tuition for me become minimal, okay? And that's, that's a good thing for me because, but also at the same time, don't forget, because I know this thing, I know a few of this essay allocation thing. So way before they apply college, I already reallocate my assets in a way that will favor it for me. So not much 
assets will be counted against me. And plus, there were two kids at the college at the same time. And plus, they got scholarship. And scholarship, when, when school give you scholarship, they don't care so much so about your income. So, so that they, they will just give it to you. So and that, because all of those conditions all meet, right? So we get the best results. So we get the optimum, the most optimal results. And after my daughter graduate from the art school and the first year she was a freelancer because at that time she has no industry experience. And my husband and I were not uh, from our industry as well. So we cannot, we don't have any con connection whatsoever. So she has to work as a freelancer and also run to different expo, arts expo to, you know, she's just like an entrepreneur. She doesn't want to work for companies. She don't want an entrepreneur. She just rent a table for maybe $100, $200 for a table and showcase her pieces. So hopefully there will be buyer or there will be scout there to spot her work and like her. So he, she has been doing that for one full year. And fortunately, second year, she landed on a project in DreamWorks doing a movie called uh, Captain Underpants. If you ask your kids that they all grow up with the comics book. So she was one of the artists doing this movie. And then after the movie is done, the project's over, and then she's starting to accumulate more experience in the industry. So she would be able to uh, get a, a, another a, a job. Uh, this is a higher job in Fox Entertainment. So now she's in Fox Entertainment, but at the same time, uh, she will use her leisure time, free time, to do some sidekick, just like a, being a, uh, on a project base to do some design for some game company. And that will help her to build up her reputation as well. But I won't say this job, I won't say this route is e easy because being an artist is almost like a, um, almost like a star, like you play in NBA or you just being a movie star or uh, actor. And it will depend on your raw talents. So this is a pretty much competitive industry. Yet again, just like in the beginning, I told you, I want my kids to see their value. I want my kids to put their passion into use. And even you can turn your passion into money-making machine, that'll be even better because every day you woke up, you don't feel you are working anymore. You feel you are living in your dream. You are feeling you, you're feeling you are living in your, uh, in your passion. You live with your passion. That power is different. That power is different. So when I talk to my son in uh, education industry, uh, I talk to my daughter in the uh, entertainment industry, I feel that they have the positive energy. They, they, it doesn't mean they don't face challenge. They face challenge just like us. But I don't see them that they will complain about their work. You know, as versus I talk to a lot of people that they do the work, it's not their like. So their middle age crisis comes earlier. You know what I mean, right? They're, oh, when can I retire? When can I retire? When can I retire? I'm just sick and tired to get up every morning. So that's the life is very different. So I was like, okay, you should just go pursue your dream. But however, I still, I'm still realistic. I'm not like, okay, just walk on the clouds. I'm still re realistic. We do have students. They are not strong headed or they are not so much so that they have the confidence they can make it in the industry, in the arts industry. So this year, uh, actually this, uh, this year and several years ago, we do have a students that they want to apply, like my daughter, apply the animation uh, in the major in college. Somehow they are lacking of that confidence. And they also feel that they may not make it a business once they graduate. They're just not confident enough. So they want to compromise but they do not want to go to do other route and then sacrifice their craving for create, creative, for uh, creativity and for arts. So they choose this uh, industrial design, which means that it's half-half. You still have to use your design ability, but on the other hand, you also need to be a little bit calculative, like a little bit engineering uh, uh, skill set. So they like to go into the center, meet in the bridge, okay? So there will be other options. You don't have to say totally ignore or deny their true passion. And just because this is not a good job market, they, they don't have a good job market. Okay, so I come to the end for tonight's presentation that I, I addressed in the beginning. 
in order for every family that you have met, you, you want to maximize your college, college application and college planning benefit, you need to know where is your st student's positioning? Where does this student stand compared to other students? Where is his passion? What is the direction that will lead him to? And at the same time, take control in your financial position and know where do you stand financially so you prepare ahead of time. And if you do it concurrently, then by the time when your kids get admitted to the college, you're gonna see a happy result and you will not see so much stress on yourself, okay? So thank you. Um, as I, I'm, I'm finished, I have finished my presentation. I wanna uh, back to you. That was amazing, Sally. As usual, uh, you are awesome. So uh, we open, we have about 20 minutes for uh, question and answer session. Uh, you have any questions? Uh, we actually have about 30 plus people we, uh, on, uh, uh, what do you call, directly 35 or so some, sometime back uh, on the Zoom session. And we are also streaming on uh, YouTube. There are about 25, 30 people there. So all of you, if you have any questions, please type in and we will read out and uh, Sally will try to answer to the best of the uh, ability possible right now. Uh, once again, uh, she is a professional. This is just a, a primer. And we know that, you all know that uh, there are 10 different sessions we are conducting. And uh, this is uh, an effort to educate, uh, to basically show that there are different areas when we are talking about comprehensive financial planning or education. It is not one retirement, it is not one kids planning, it's not one estate planning, it's not just uh, knowing basics of finance 101 or 201 or risk management, These, all of them put together. That's where uh, we, we spent a lot of time, me and uh, uh, Mr. Leila Prasad uh, from Samhiti. So we spent quite some time trying to come up with these topics and in the next few, uh, 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 a few weeks, we have topics, uh, um, retirement planning, as well as uh, social security and healthcare planning in retirement. That is a big one. Most of the people will be worried uh, or a lot of people may think that healthcare, it's, I mean, uh, Medicare will cover everything. It's not the case. So we have a lot of stuff lined up. If you want to really know more about it or uh, will be uh, want to be part of this, you're welcome to contact me or Mr. Leva Prasad. And with that, um, uh, Leva Prasad, do you see any uh, questions coming through the uh, YouTube channel for Sally? I have seen some here. Yeah, go ahead, uh, Sally. Okay, I, I have seen some here, so I can give a quick answer, okay? So okay. I see one, uh, one ask me, I, am I an independent counselor or we have a company? Okay, so the thing is that I am an independent counselor, but I do have a team, okay? But uh, tonight I'm not going to uh, sell myself at all. I'm, this is a nonprofit organization, so I'm coming here to share the information with you and um, you want to check with your school counselor um, unless you're a student coming from a public high school so the public high school is a little bit challenged because their counselor the job of a college uh, of a high school counselor their main job is to help your student exit the high school so they are not their job is not help your student to get into a good college so it's, if your students have uh, take the challenging courses or not involved in kind of uh, some kind of activity or not, it's not their job. And they certainly will not advise you on the money issue, on the college funding issue. So if your kids are in um, public high school, then it's a little bit challenging for you to get the information. And number two is that, um, but however, if your students are very proactive and then they can keep a good relationship with their uh, teachers, then later they can still ask their favor, not only just write them, help them to write a letter of recommendation. They can also help them to brush up their, their um, essay, okay? So I do not suggest you to go to find professional help right away. Uh, you can try to first find out uh, the resources among you. And then if you still don't have any, then we can uh, chat uh, on, the, on the site. 
And also uh, for students, they are in private high school, usually you pay the high school tuition. So your school counselor should do more job than the public high school. So take advantage of that. Get them engaged in school selection. They may, the only thing they are lacking maybe is on the financial side because they are not about to give you any financial advice anyways. Um, but you can take advantage of their knowledge about the colleges and select the fit school for your students and maybe help them to touch up your essay or arrange the extra curriculum. Uh, that I think a private college, a private school, a high school counselor may offer that kind of uh, services. You just need to talk to your school about that. But for financial planning wise, um, I strongly recommend that you go to SR, go to any person that invites you. Uh, if they are, they have the financial license to do that, they will know how to help you to relocate or allocate your assets so that your EFC can be reduced. Okay, another question coming is that I have rental properties, okay? So what about my, uh, my mortgages? Will that be considered uh, to be deducted from EFC? Um, okay, that's how school calculated. They will first go, uh, when you file the form, you have to enter what is the fair market value, okay? So the fair market value is the fair market value, not, not your purchasing price. So that's the thing. It's a fair market value and the minus whatever you owe, then the number, the answer will become your equity. So that's the equity will be counted, will be added to calculate your EFC. Okay, so yes. So the answer, direct the answer, yes, they will consider your mortgage. So you use the fair market value, fair market value minus your mortgage. The answer will be the equity. So the equity will be counted. And also uh, someone says, okay, how, what about the second home? If I have vacation home, will this be considered a school? So by definition, I know some people own two homes and for, to be counted as a vacation home or second home, you have to be distance, geographic distance has to be 50 miles apart. So you cannot buy a home here and then across the street, you buy another home. And then even though you didn't rent out, maybe you just live there empty, but you want to claim it as second home. No, uh, when you do the accounting, when you file the tax, Second home, the definition of your second home or vacation home has to be 50 miles at least minimum apart, okay, to be considered second home. So if that criteria is met and then you do not rent it out, you do not collect rent, maybe, I don't know, maybe your parents live in there, okay, you, you, your parents live in there, it's under your name, but your parents live in there and you, didn't, you did not collect rent from your parents and it's, 50 miles apart, then you can you can claim that as a second home from the FASA, yes. Okay, the third question, another question. Rental property home equity loan can be used to deduction for calculate? Okay, uh, equity loan is that, yes, if you use, uh, well, has to be you already used up. If you did not use up, you just have this equity loan on the side as an emergency fund, then that's not a deduction, okay? If you borrow money out as line of credit and then you use it up to do home improvement maybe, then that can be counted that you have less equity. Consider you have more heavier mortgage, yes. Okay, all right, I think I- We yeah. have one more here, right? Okay, oh, Ross IRA, okay. Yeah. Okay, as a, a, a parents ask, um, they have Ross IRA, but this uh, as a Ross IRA is under their kid's name. Will this affect their financial aid? If it's Ross IRA under the kid's name, it doesn't matter because it's considered a retirement account. So retirement account will be forgiven. Will be forgiven. Okay. I have one question here, yeah. Sandy, uh, from the YouTube channel. Uh, uh -huh. Could you please elaborate on 529 plan and how it's counted or not towards the EFC. Okay, so 529 is like this. 529 is considered a uh, education designated program. So you save on 20, 529 and government said all the K 
capital gain is tax free. Why is tax free? Because you want to pay towards your kids' tuition. That's the whole purpose. So when you take it out of the money, if you do not pay towards your kids' tuition, there will be penalty, number one. Number two, because this is an education designated program, so when, the, when you apply financial aid, there will be a column to ask you, do you have 529? And you have to answer yes, because your social security, once you type in your social security, all uh, on your schedule D will show everything. If you file the tax yourself, Schedule D will reveal all your financial institution. So, so it will show. And then once you said you have, let's say you, I do have a clients like that, okay? The situation I, I want to share with you. This parents, his income is about $200,000. And then he saved the 529 when he, his, his kids was little. So by the time his kids uh, was in uh, senior year, there were about $120,000 in his 529. And the thing is that by the time when his kid turned into senior year and applied to college, the father got laid off in about July time frame. And that, at that time, the college application is just about to, to get in. That's a 11th grader turning to 12th grader. So, so he has to report, right? But because his income dropped, almost 50%. So he told, he's totally qualified financial aid. But because he has that $120,000 sitting in the 529, and the school, and actually the student got accepted to Santa Clara University. So the, the financial aid officer in Santa Clara University advised them that they have to deplete this $120,000. And if they still need help, then they will kick in the financial aid. So can you imagine? Nobody wants to be laid off, but in this Silicon Valley or in any state, job change nowadays is become even fickle. When COVID-19, all the industry shift, right? So I will say, when you do the planning, you want to plan it more conservatively, means plan the best way that there's no gap for you later, oh, if I lose my job or I have a job change and I totally qualify for more aid, but because there's some assets in here that in a way I cannot get. So make it more conservative. So in that way, 529 will not fit to most of the family, especially middle income family, unless your income is over $300,000, $350,000, that's all the way until your kids go into college. If you can 100% make sure that income will be always there for you and you don't care, then yes, 529 will be a good option for this type of family because they won't be able to get financial, I said, need-based aid anymore, but they will still be qualified for um, scholarship from the school, okay? Yet scholar for to get scholarship, they don't care so much so about your income or assets. Mostly it's uh, income, they don't care. So that's why I say, if you have higher income, more than $300,000 or above, and you can make sure this income will keep coming to your way all the way your kids go to college, then yes, you can start saving 529. Now, if you are not sure, then uh, using 7702, especially when your kids are still younger. If your kids are already in high school, then 7702 won't help you much because life insurance, you need at least 10 years or above than 10 years um, to jumpstart the power, to see the power kicks in, in order for you to not just only shelter the, in, uh, the assets into the insurance cash value, but also later when you take it out to pay a certain amount of the tuition, it's tax-free. It's not like 529. It's like 529, you don't have to pay tax, yet unlike 529, the money in the cash value will not be counted against your EFC. So it's, it's a, we call it an alternative 529. So alternative 20, 529 will be better. So, but it will only work when your kids are still younger. But then again, if your kids are in high school and you are thinking to fund it 529 for your kids' college education, that is too late as well. There will be only four years. And there is a limited amount for you to put into um, 529 versus then put it into life insurance. Life insurance usually will have higher cap. So it doesn't matter 529 or life insurance. 
if you study at high school, it's just too late, a little bit too late for you to accumulate the power, okay? So starting early is the best way to do it. Okay, any more questions? Do you have any more questions, uh, Leila Prasad Uh Right. I don't yeah, have one question. So one question, Sally. So many of the, uh, our audience here are the young parents. And what would be your advice to the young parents? Uh, uh, you mean for how the, do they prepare? Uh, could you repeat that? You say more parents are Indian parents? No. Thank Most you. of our audience here in the YouTube channel are young parents. And what would be your advice to the young parents on planning the college? I'll, I'll repeat that. Young parents. Oh, younger parents. Okay. Younger parents. Okay. So like I said, if younger parents, your kids are like in elementary, kindergarten, or even still in, in your tummy, conceive, just conceive. Uh, that's the best way. Um, you are advised to sit down with uh, your inviter or uh, a ZAP that sit down with the uh, financial advisor. We can run some illustration to show you that uh, you will have much more tools to use. Uh, for first, number one, if you want to invest in investment property, just think again. Uh, investment property, of course, uh, I cannot say it's not a good investment um, because uh, it may be if you choose the right location and get into the market in the right timing, it may help you to increase a lot of equity. But just later when you apply college, um, investment property in private school and in public school they will all think this is your lifestyle, okay? This is something like a cherry on the top. So they will weight heavily on that. So number two, if you're younger parents and uh, if you are not sure, your income will, will be so high all the way until your kids go to college. So leverage 772 uh, program will be uh, the smart way because time is still on your side and you do have time to compound and compound your cash value, not only those cash value will not be calculated against your EFC, um, later when you need to take a little bit money out of there to pay for your kids tuition, you can take it out tax free. So you will have a double purpose. So that's my advice for them. If you have younger children. How many years of W2 is used for the calculation of EFC? Yeah, you, usually before it was only two years, but now school wants to sometimes, they want to look at three years. So 10th grader is the base year, and then 11th grader is when you apply the college, they're gonna see that year's tax return. Once you get, uh, once you are turning to 12th grader, that year they're gonna do some uh, review or they're gonna do some auditing, audit to see if you are consistent. So, so if so parents lose jobs thanks to this current situation, uh, high school seniors and all, uh, but they had good salaries in the last two years, uh, will they be impacted in the negative way? Okay, no, they, they, you still have to submit your previous year's income, which appears higher, and then you have to do one more move. You need to do appeal, appealing process. You need to connect directly with the school that accepts you and then write a letter, explain the situation and submit your current income, uh, uh, current tax, uh, tax return showing that your income has been lower due to the loss of the job and then you can get appeal and their financial uh, officer will go online to change your EFC and then give you the aid. That's a I have two questions which are coming on my chat here on my phone. Uh, uh, one question is, do you have any way of uh, any recommendation how you match kid and the student to small setting school vis-a-vis -vis big school? Yes. How do you do that? Um, every counselor is supposed to have the tool to help you, not just me. As long as they are professional, they claim they are college counselor, they're supposed to have the tool or the test or survey that can help your students to do that, okay? So now you have to work with, with counselor. Um, they're supposed to have the tool. And once the student has done that, and, uh, and maybe through some interview, a little bit, interview process, then would be able to help the students to narrow down the school list 
that will fit their personality and their academic and maybe your finance as well. Excellent. One last question is, uh, I know you talked about uh, EFCs and all the, how the students can get scholarships, but once they get into the school, they're not able to get the scholarship to start with, but we know that there are a ton of different scholarship Pell Grants or uh, private fundings or schools, uh, different. Uh, is there any recommendation on how you can educate or help these students to figure out how to get money even when they're not able to get a uh, scholarship in the beginning? Okay, so I will advise that to work with the school scholarship is much better than you go to find out some uh, like a Coca-Cola Foundation, McDonald Foundation, or maybe your employ employer, some corporate, they offer their employee um, the, the, the kids for their employee, right? They can apply some scholarship, but those are tiny money. And also they have to write tons of essay to qualify, to maybe compete for that $500, $1,000. And the thing is that the school is so funny. If you receive any outside private scholarship, you need to report to the school. And let's say, let's say the school wants to give you $10,000 scholarship. And then once you receive the scholarship from outside foundation or outside, uh, outside any organization give you the scholarship and you need to, you need to uh, file to the school and they gonna deduct from their own offer. Let's say the school decide to give you $20,000 and then they see you get 5,000 from a private uh, scholarship organization, they offer you that. They're gonna less than 5,000, they give you 15,000. So the best way is to work on school's scholarship by filing the financial application and also by study, research the school's philosophy and then choose the school accordingly with the strategy. Okay, makes sense. So with that, uh, oh, uh, Lila Prasad, you are clear there on the YouTube channel? So we are clear on the YouTube channel, but there is one just one question that just came in the Zoom. Okay. okay. There, there is one parent ask. He said, uh, she said, uh, or he, uh, okay, he said, if there is no money for education, can they take a break from the school and continue after a few months? Uh, of course, the student is student. You can take one gap year and then coming back, no problem. But the question is why there's no money for education? It's because the parents lost the income, so you become your income become very low, so you don't have the income. If that's the case, you totally can apply. You talk to the school, your income has changed. So you will get financial aid. So don't worry about that if you, it's because of your income drops. But if it's that you earn good amount of income, but you are a big spender, okay? You, you live a luxurious life, you spend it all and you have no money to fund your kids' education, then, then school will not help you, okay? That's awesome, Sally. That, uh, thanks a lot. Uh, that was an uh, amazing session. So all of you who are still there, uh, these are the next classes that are lined up. We have next week retirement planning. I will be taking that. And on August 13th, we have social security. On August uh, uh, 20th, we have healthcare planning. I am bringing industry experts uh, uh, to share their wisdom. Uh, please don't miss these sessions and hope to see you all in the future sessions. Uh, Sally, once again, thanks a lot. Uh, Lila Prasadgar, you have a word to share? Thank you. Thank you for everybody. Good night. Thank you. Thank you, Sally. It's been an amazing session. Uh, there is a lot of appreciation from the YouTube uh, uh, audience as well. Uh, this has been a very informative session, and we thank you very much from uh, Samasti on behalf of Samasti. Okay, it's my honor. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, good night, all. Okay, good night, all. Yeah. So, I'll turn it just through this session.